Okay, everyone can hear? Good. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I have to confess, I was a little surprised when I got the invitation because I thought, what do I know about this topic? And I was assured, I hope correctly, that I wasn't expected to speak specifically about uh, GMOs or biotechnology in Emda, but the, give the very broad picture about sustainable development. The, sort of the global, if you like, uh, and, and even sort of development uh, perspective on the topic. And that's fine by me because although I have worked quite a lot on environment, almost all my work has been in developing countries. So I will talk therefore very broadly about sustainable development. If I have time, I'll talk a little bit about Rio plus 20, what we can expect or not expect from that, but that won't be my first priority. So, okay, well, we all know that the definition came from the Brundtland Report, a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But it's useful to look at the background to that report and to see, and, and, and that commission, because the commission started out, in fact, with a rather environment uh, emphasis, but they included in the commission many people from the South, and as part of their work, they travelled around the South, and the more they travelled, the more they saw that it is a rather complicated issue, and not least, there are co at least, perhaps, conflicts uh, of at least two dimensions. One, environment versus, versus development. Is, is concern for the environment going to be holding back development? And secondly, is this a North versus South issue? Is this an agenda being developed by the North and imposed on the South, to put it simply? And so the, the uh, Commission report was um, against a, a fairly complex background, which they increasingly well understood. Now, what is sustainable development? Well, there's more than 100 definitions now. Everybody likes coming up with their own definition, whether they're NGOs or bureaucrats or academics. Everybody says, well, actually, we've got a better definition for our purpose. Um, I still think the actual that the Brundtl one is quite good for a number of reasons, so I always start with the Brundtl one. But I think it's important to emphasize that it's an aspiration. This is something, it's a concept, but we have no empirical evidence that it can be done. You might say that historically some countries have, have succeeded in developing without uh, unduly damaging the environment, but as an asp in terms of what happens in the future, uh, it's an aspiration. We don't know yet whether it's possible to achieve it in practice. Indeed, there are severe doubts whether it is possible. It will be a huge challenge. And it's a challenge in terms of ethics, in terms of politics, in economics, in terms of law. Because at, at the base, it is an ethical issue, but the instruments that are required to achieve a sustainable development will be economic and, and legal mainly. So the way of summarizing the challenge is in this simple equation, which go back to the early 70s from the limits to growth debate. The challenge is that the human impact on the environment at a global level is a function of population, affluence, and technology. And global population is growing. As we know, it's, slow, it's slower than it was, but it's still growing. Affluence in most countries is generally growing. There may be increasing inequalities between and within countries, but nevertheless, in the aggregate, affluence is growing. And it's worth emphasizing that it's growing just as fast as population, so that a lot of the debate about uh, why we need to solve the global environmental problem by reducing population, you could also ask, yes, but <laughs> in terms of the effect on, on uh, the env global environment, reducing um, affluence, or at least um, uh, ceasing to increase consumption would be equally effective. In fact, it would be more effective if the population is in the north. So, population is growing, affluence growing, and technology, well, everyone looks to technology as the answer, and indeed it can contribute quite a lot. But, it, at least in my view, it's extremely unlikely to make enough difference to compensate for growth in affluence and population. And this concept of the ecological footprint, of which you may have heard, it's a concept which tries to capture the impact of each one of us on the global environment. And there are interesting calculations. Of course, there's a lot of controversy about exactly how you measure it and what you measure. But there can be little doubt that for most countries in the north, 
it's already too large. If everybody in the world consumed the same amount and the same as, as we do, it would be in, in, inconceivable in environmental terms. But everybody wants affluence. In fact, it would be political suicide for politicians to argue otherwise. And this is the challenge which we have to face. So, does it mean everyone will run out of resources? We're going to run out of copper and zinc and oil and everything else? <clears throat> well, no, the answer, whether we, some people think it's good, some think it's bad, but the, the market will tend to resolve this because it'll function so as to allocate limited resources to those who have the economic clout. People who are rich will be able to afford resources, but it will have negative effects on those who have less economic clout. And biofuels is just one example. <clears throat> As oil prices rise, the demand for biofuels will rise, which will in turn increase the price of food at the expense of poor people all over the world. So that, yes, if you say, will we run out of resources? Well, we, the rich, will not, but others who are less advantaged in, in the competition of the market will indeed lose out. So what about environmental pollution? And this is a very sort of simple distinction between running out of resources and polluting the environment. And the sort of the so-called environmental Kuznets curve, which, which claims that as incomes rise, it's possible to counteract environmental damage. That may be true on, to some extent on, in terms of pollution. So economic growth can indeed be positive in countering pollution, although global warming is another matter, a, a very large matter. Um, it's also, but it's also useful to remember that sometimes we solve our pollution problems by exporting them to poor countries or to poor regions within our country or even poor parts of our city. You note where, where rubbish dumps are located in cities, quite interesting to show the, inc the relationship between income levels and location of rubbish dumps. So, po so to some extent, we solve our uh, pollution problems by uh, technological uh, means, but also by passing them on to others. So the key point here then is that sustainable development is an ethical issue. It's, it's, it's a question about equity, who gains and who loses. And to put it simply, it's a question about the rights of relatively rich people alive today as against poor people alive today and as against future generations. And this, as I said, I'm not going to try and relate directly to the, to the challenge which was just outlined in the introduction, but, but when you say... Is this is uh, is something beneficial to society? The question is, who? What is society? Who is society? If it means us, rich Norwegians, or does it mean poor people in the rest of the world, or does it mean future generations? And this is a crucially uh, important ethical issue. There are also, in the many, in view of many people, also the rights of nature as against of humans. So that if unless you take a, an extreme anthropocentric view, then you would also include the ethical dimension. Uh, of nature. Um, interestingly, one of the advantages of the Brinton definition is that it avoids specifying which of these is the most important. <laughs> uh, that's, so you say, well, which is more important? Is it, is it, fut is, is it nature? Is it um, um, poor people? Well, by talking, everyone can agree that future generations are important. So that's one of the sort of, and I put a little question mark because it's an advantage in some sense because everyone can agree about it. But it, it is a disadvantage because it leaves actually some important ethical issues unresolved. So what's to be done? And it has, things have to be done at global level, national level, at local level. And in order to do something, you need public action. It's not enough for individuals to act. And in order to achieve public action, you need instruments and the most the obvious instruments are economic instruments like taxes and subsidies. Like you need laws, which may be national laws or they may be international conventions. And you may be able to use information and persuasion to change people's behavior. But what you certainly need is political leadership. So this is where one turns from ethics to politics. <coughs> what problem is that what government is willing to incur the political cost? to persuade people to change their consumption patterns. For example, by increasing petrol taxes. We know that there's a very, very simple way of reducing oil consumption, that is to put up taxes. We also know that that is a very sure way in which to lose an election. Um, and as I say, in, in changing consumption patterns is one thing, and, and 
to suggest that people should actually lower their consumption levels is certainly even more suicidal. So, I would claim that we're further from achieving sustainable development now than we were 20 years ago. So I put the emphasis here on sustainable because uh, the development, at least if you measure it in, in narrow terms of economic growth, you can say, yes, there has been considerable pro progress in development terms. And even if you have a slightly wider definition, including sort of human development indicators. So in many ways, yes, there has been development, but is it sustainable? And I suggest that, in fact, we're further away than we were 20 years ago. So, I'd like now just to say a little bit about, since I have the time, about Rio plus 20. How are we responding adequately to this massive challenge? As I hope you all know, there's going to be a major conference uh, next month called Rio plus 20 because it is 20 years since the 1992 Rio conference. And there, quite a good deal was achieved. There's the Rio Declaration, there's the Agenda 21, which is a, uh, an agenda for local action at different countries, forest principles, and a couple of uh, conventions were open for signature, the Convention on <laughs> Biological Diversity and the Framework Convention on Climate Change. But a bad deal was also done implicitly, because in effect what happened was that the North said, if you people in the South don't talk about consumption, we, the people in the North, won't talk about population. That was clearly not an explicit uh, a deal, and you will find references to sustainable consumption in, the, in some of the uh, material. But essentially, this was, everyone agreed that let's not, look, let's not talk about the things that really matter. Right? So you don't talk about consumption, we won't talk about population. Which, of course, are the two crucial issues. Now, since that time, quite a lot has changed. The North-South distinction has become even less meaningful. I mean, 20 years ago, it was not very meaningful, but with the rise of China, India, Brazil, and so on, it's, it's not particularly meaningful to talk about North and South in that simple sense, nor indeed in political terms. Another important change, of course, is climate change, which was on the agenda 20 years ago. It's, written, it's risen much higher on the agenda since then. And some progress has been made. I mean, the North does recognize a shared but differentiated responsibility both for causing climate change and for coping with the consequences. And although a lot of people are quite, uh, quite depressed about what was achieved or not achieved at, at Kyoto, <laughs> it sometimes looks as if we'll look back and say, Kyoto, that was the high point. That was when we actually did achieve something. Because although it was small in, in practical terms, it was very important in, in, if you like, symbolic terms, because the North accepted a responsibility, and as I say, not a a shared but also differentiated responsibility. So the principle uh, that was established at Kyoto was, was very important. Unfortunately, it hasn't been particularly well followed up. So Rio plus 20, what's new? Rio plus 20 is the green economy. That's the, the, the key word, the buzzword for Rio plus 20. And this is how UNEP, this is the United Nations Environment Program, they define a green economy as one that results in, quote, improved human well-being and social equity while significantly reducing environmental risks and, environmental and ecological scarcities. And then there's a longer definition as they explain that it comes out of a, a, a tradition of environmental economics. Environmental economists have been talking about these sort of ideas for some time. And they're saying now it's come up to the, sort of the top of the agenda. Well, <laughs> it looks a bit like Yartak Begadella. Um, <laughs> economic growth and protection of the environment. I mean, it, 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 the name green economy looks just like a, a repackaging of, of sustainable development, perhaps even a, a, a more so technocratic uh, economic type repackaging. And it looks as if nobody is willing to take the consequences of uh, economic growth for the environment. It's a rather cynical quote from George Monbiot, who you may know from The, the Guardian. And I'm afraid I think it rather sums up the situation. Our problem, nobody ever rioted for austerity. Faced with the choice between the survival of the planet and a new set of matching tableware, most people would choose the tableware. <laughs> and I fear that that is not inaccurate. The green economy concept is very much technology based on the technology and the market. Market forces combined with technology can 
solve our problems. But there's a nice quote that I like to use, which is, the market is a bad master but a good servant. The market is a very effective instrument. If you are willing to use taxes and subsidies, you can substantially change people's behavior. There's no doubt about that. So in that sense, it's a good servant. But it's a bad master in the sense that if you leave decisions to the market, then you effectively uh, you give up the responsibility of politicians to take the sort of leadership role that is necessary both for present and future generations. So political leadership is needed. The instruments, economic and legal, are available, but what government is willing to incur the political cost of using them? I'm afraid I'm not very confident. Rio plus 20 will not be a game changer. The world is not yet ready. So I'm sorry to have a negative conclusion to my talk, but I think it's realistic to face the situation, as, at least as I see it. Thank you very much.